Good evening, and thank you for being with us tonight for our study in Acts. Uh, we had some problems with the recording during the live Bible class, so this is uh, being recorded just for video only. So the benefit that you get by watching this particular class on video is that there won't be the uh, times when people in the class are talking and uh, you're not able to, to hear as well and, and, and get everything happening in the class, which I know is a disadvantage. So this works out as, as an advantage to you. And uh, again, we appreciate you participating in this wonderful study, the book of Acts. I'm going to go back to the end of chapter 10 and uh, cover some things that we covered uh, at the end of last week that I felt like we were a little rushed on and I want to make sure we're covered thoroughly so that people uh, have an understanding. And so we're going to be in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. And let me read that for you. While Peter was still saying these things, remember Peter is at Cornelius' house. Uh, Cornelius a Gentile. God has given Cornelius earlier in chapter 10 a vision of the uh, uh, blanket coming down with all kinds of animals. He says, kill and eat. He does this three times. He is teaching Peter that uh, called nothing unclean. And now the vision is about food. Peter is a Jew learning to be a Christian under the new covenant in Christ. And that uh, he's no longer following the Jewish customs and laws when it comes to eating. But God is doing something more than that because of what is happening now at the house of Cornelius. So verse 44 of chapter 10 while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to baptize in the name to be baptized in, in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. So what is happening? The Holy Spirit is falling, has fallen on Cornelius and his household, family, and those he has invited. And uh, the Holy Spirit has fallen on them. But the question is, is this the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? that Peter taught on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.38. Some do teach that. Some say, see, they received the Holy Spirit before they were baptized. Therefore, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. They use this to show that baptism isn't essential for salvation. So there's a key detail, however, in verse 45, where Peter where Peter says that the Holy Spirit was poured out even on Gentiles. So that tells us something. That tells us, referring back to God's vision that he gave Peter on the rooftop, that God is making a, uh, teaching a lesson to Peter to understand that the Gentiles are accepted into the kingdom of God, into the church. Uh, just like uh, the, he's saying in the vision that all animals were okay to eat. Now in verse 34, let me read back up to verse 34 of Acts chapter 10. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Shows no partiality. In the Greek, that word shows no partiality is made up of two Greek words, face and to take or receive. Face and to take or receive. And it means receiving or rejecting someone based on their face or their outward appearance, their outward characteristics. Peter is saying that he has learned from God that God does not accept or reject someone based on their outward characteristics. Does that make sense? And so, look at verse 47. What connection does Peter make between the day of Pentecost uh, 
and this day with Cornelius. And it's really clear what's happening here. The connection is the baptism of the Holy Spirit was the same. So look at our slide here. We see that uh, on the last point that I've made here, this was not the baptism of Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 is about becoming a Christian, a child of God, being repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit given at baptism, at conversion, at the point of a person being saved. This was not the baptism of Acts 2.38, but the baptism of Acts 2, 3, and 4, when the apostles were there and others in the upper room praying, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them like tongues of fire. They spoke in tongues. There was a mighty uh, sound of a mighty rushing, roaring wind, that, and this attracted the uh, attention of those around them. They were obviously near the temple courts. And uh, that was the setting that uh, was ahead of Peter preaching the gospel, the first gospel message uh, that became the first group of converts as the church was established there in Acts 2. So the only times there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost with the apostles, tongues as a fire, the Holy Spirit descends on them, they speak in tongues, and Acts chapter 10 with the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit falling on the Gentiles. If someone says, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, or we baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's not true, it's not biblical, it's not sound, it's error, because the only times we have baptism of the Holy Spirit are those two occasions in the book of Acts. This, this to cl so to claim that this incident of the Holy Spirit falling on the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 proves baptism isn't essential for salvation means you must ignore Acts 2.38. You have to ignore it. You have to say it doesn't mean that or that there are more than one ways to become a Christian. That's all you can do. You have to deal with Acts 2.38. You either say it's wrong, it's not teaching that, or you ignore it, and then you therefore misunderstand the purpose of the Spirit coming upon the apostles. If you see it as Peter explains things, as he does explain things in, in Acts 2.38, and you maintain that Acts 2.38 is legitimate, that uh, it says what it uh, means it means what it says then then that means they would have received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when they actually became Christians when they were immersed at that point which happens after the Holy Spirit falls on them and Peter says can anyone uh, withhold water from them so the Holy Spirit falling on them there in Acts chapter 10 and they sp spoke in tongues was not granting salvation Cornelius and his household were not actually saved yet, to be technical. This was God confirming the gospel was for all people. And now was the time to add the Gentiles to the church. Remember last week we looked at Matthew 16 and Peter's confession that Jesus was the Son of God. And Jesus said that on this rock, meaning rock of faith, this, this confession of faith in Jesus as the Son of God, on that rock I will build my church. And Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And then we see in Acts 15, we talked about last week, where Peter says, by my mouth the Gentiles you know, would hear the gospel. So, so God is using Peter here in this moment to unlock the door, the kingdom of heaven, to the Gentiles, and they are welcome into the church. So here's another point. For segregation to have ever happened, ever, anywhere in the Lord's church is, at any time, is a complete 
an absolute misunderstanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God. Because from the beginning, the gospel was for all people. And yet, historically, it has been withheld from some people. Thankfully, that is not the case today uh, in, uh, in this country and elsewhere. And, but it is sad to know that there was a time, at any time in history, where the gospel was withheld, where there was people who were kept from the Lord's church or said, you go over there because it's an absolute misunderstanding, misread, total miss of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it was for all, is for all people of all times equally. Now, Peter tells us three times what God was doing here. So it in no way is possible for this to be saying that the Gentiles were saved because the Holy Spirit came upon them. In Acts 10, 47 through 48, as you see on the slide, which we've already read. But look at Acts eleven seventeen when Peter uh, is retelling the story to the apostles and brothers there in Jerusalem, as we're going to read and talk about in a moment. But verse 17 these are Peter's words as he recounts what's hap what happened. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in the way of God? So he's saying, I, I, can't, I couldn't get in the way of God. I couldn't deny that the Gentiles could uh, come into the kingdom. Now, the, when he says, if, the, if then God gave them the same gift he gave to us when we believed, that does... I understand, sound like the gift of the Holy Spirit at baptism. But that's not what he's talking about. The same gift of the Holy Spirit descending on them as it did in the day of Pentecost in the house, that's the same gift of salvation, of saying you're welcome into the kingdom, Jew and Gentile alike. That's what Peter is talking about. And Peter says, who was I to stand in God's way? What a wonderful example that was uh, for us to see, hey, if something's right, if this is what God is doing, don't you stand in God's way with your agenda, with your preference, with your, uh, uh, your opinion. You back up and get out of God's way and go along with it. And then the third one was in Acts 15, 8 and 9, which you could look at. That's at the Jerusalem Council where Peter is also retelling, recounting the, the, uh, the story, the incident with Cornelius and his household. So go back to verse 44 of Acts chapter 10. And look, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. If you read verses 34 through 43, you get this wonderful... Uh, beginning part of Peter preaching the gospel to Cornelius and his household. It's a wonderful uh, summary as he, as he did in Acts chapter 2. But we see here that Peter, Peter's sermon, his lesson, his teaching was interrupted by God. He wasn't done yet. He had just gotten started. And God interrupts Peter and says, okay, that's enough. Boom! And the Holy Spirit descends on them. And then when we look at chapter 11, verse 4, Luke tells us this, and Peter began and explained it to them in order. So, so Luke, Dr. Luke, is saying, here's the order in which these, these, uh, these events, uh, everything played out. I was in the city, Peter says, of Joppa praying. He goes through the entire experience. And then you get to verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us in the beginning. As I began to speak, verse 44 of chapter 10, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on them. See? Peter had just gotten started and God interrupted and said, that's enough. You've done a good job. Now the Holy Spirit is coming because 
I'm showing you that the Gentiles are welcome into the church, into the kingdom. It's a wonderful, amazing thing. Now, let's turn to chapter 11. And we see here comes the criticism. Here comes the criticism. Look at verses 1 through 3. I'll read those for you. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Remember, Cornelius asked them to remain with them for some days at the end of chapter 10. So before they asked any questions, they hear stuff. They hear Peter and those with him or with Gentiles. They don't ask any questions. They don't say, hey, tell, what have you been doing? Give us an update. They just start criticizing. And isn't that what we do so often? We don't ask a question. We just hear stuff and we think we know. We think we understand what's going on and we just start criticizing instead of, hey, can you tell me what's going on? Is this what I heard? What, what's the truth? What's happening here? Tell me what I need to know. What do I need to understand? But thankfully, they listened to Peter as he explained and, and, and they understood then what God was doing. Notice verse 17 of chapter 11. As we, as we read this, again, we'll read verse 17 and 18. If then God gave the, the, the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? So now the apostles and brothers in Jerusalem are hearing Peter say this. Who was, I, who was he to stand in God's way? Verse 18, when they heard these things, they did what? They fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. See, once they stopped and listened, thankfully they received the truth and listened to the truth. And they also did not stand in God's way. And then they rejoiced. They praised God for what God was doing. <coughs> That's a wonderful example. At first, they don't provide us a good example. Then they provide us a good example of what we should do. Listen. Find out what is God doing? What is the Bible teaching? What is it uh, the elders uh, are leading us in, assuming they are sound and moving us in the right direction, the, the, the preacher, the minister, uh, and, then, and then rejoice in what God is doing and get behind that effort. Couldn't the church be more blessed and more effective if we would operate in that way? Now, look at verses 19 through 26. We'll kind of summarize things here. <clears throat> I want to hit on one main point. In verses 19 through 26, what we see is Barnabas and Saul again. We haven't seen Saul in a little while. And now Barnabas and Saul, we find that they, the gospel has reached Antioch. You see, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the gospel continues to spread. The church is growing. It's reaching outside of Jerusalem. More and more people are hearing the gospel in other cities, and now Gentiles also. It has reached Antioch, where the church continues to grow among Jews and Gentiles. It is in Antioch, we find in verse 26, that for whatever reason, Christ followers are first called what? Christians. Now, some say that this was a derogatory name. Maybe you've also heard that, that it was meant to uh, demean them. It was meant as an insult, derogatory, to call them, those Jesus followers, Christians. That might be so. I'm not convinced of that. Uh, Maybe there's, there are sources that confirm that. I did not see them. Uh, I, I don't know that that's super important. But what I want to focus on regarding the name, the title Christian, is not the possibility that it could have been a derogatory uh, title, but what it actually means. 
Christ, it's made up of two words, Christ, meaning the anointed one, and in, I-A-N, the ending there, it signifies ownership, belonging to. So what does that mean? Christian is one who is the property of, who belongs to Christ, Jesus. Now, isn't that what we ought to want to be called? You know, you see people wear the t-shirts, sweatshirts, uh, property of, and it'll say the name of a college, property of Harvard, property of uh, Texas A&M, property of uh, UT, property of uh, ACU, uh, whatever it might be. And we wear those proudly. We wear, we say, look, property of, and we say, I'm property of such and such place. That's what wearing the name Christian is saying. That I am the property of Christ. I belong to Christ. I am His. He is mine. Why on earth would I want to be called by any other name other than Christian? Why would I want to wear any one of these many, many denominational names and titles and designations that call me anything other than Christian? I don't want to be called, thought of, known by anything else except Christian. Is Christ not sufficient? Is the name Christian not enough to be called something else? Say, what religion are you? What faith are you? What church do you go to? What, what are, say, if, if I'm saying anything else, then am I not saying that Christ is not enough for me? That he is not sufficient? That I need some name man came up with? That, that man devised? That man put together to name themselves, to call themselves, to go by, to be known as? Why is Christian not sufficient. Is Jesus not enough? That's all we should be known by. And that's what we mean by, that's what is meant by the, uh, the designation, Church of Christ, the church that belongs to, it's property of, owned by Christ. It's not a denominational title. It is saying who owns us. Christian. Church of Christ, person belonging to Christ, people belonging to Christ. Peter wrote, Paul wrote rather, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, that uh, you are not your own, you were bought with a price. Now, we see in verses 27 through 30 of Acts chapter 11, that the church continues what it did earlier, as we saw in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, that it continues to help one another through benevolence. We see in Acts that benevolence is a core function of the Lord's church. And what we see is that benevolence toward those inside the church is a core function of the Lord's church. They did a tremendous amount to care for one another. That's important. We are not saying, the Bible is not saying, don't do good deeds and be benevolent outside of the fellowship. Obviously, that's a good thing to do. That uh, speaks well of us. That shows our care and concern for the community, for those abroad. That's a good thing to be zealous for good works. Any good work we can find that we're able to do. We ought, to, we ought to do. But what we see in Scripture is that they were very much, uh, uh, they very much valued, they were very much about, they focused on caring for one another in various ways. And that's something that we ought to continue to do if we're going to be the Lord's church, is to be benevolent toward one another. Uh, 
Paul wrote in uh, Galatians 6.10 to, uh, to do good uh, unto all people, especially unto the household of faith. Okay, let's turn to chapter 12. We've got a little bit left as we uh, look in chapter 12. And we'll see, not the empire strikes back, but Herod strikes back. Now in chapter 12, we're, we find, we're in verses 1 through 5, that this is the beginning of persecution coming from the government, coming from outside of the church and outside of Judaism. So far, we have pretty much just seen persecution or, or Satan's attacks come from within the church and from within Judaism, you know, Pharisees and Sadducees, Saul. Now we see persecution, attacks from Satan, come from more externally and now from the government, from the king himself, King Herod. This King Herod is uh, the grandson of Herod the Great. Now let me read verses 1 through 5. For you of Acts chapter 12. About that time, uh, Herod, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter. This was during the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. Verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now this James who was killed is not Jesus' brother. This is the son of Zebedee. They were also, him and his brother John uh, were called sons of thunder. But this James, along with John and along with Peter, were the three who were in Jesus' innermost circle. Uh, this is the three who were, these are the three who were with Jesus through, uh, as we looked in the book of Mark in one of our sermon series on Sunday mornings recently, um, was with Jesus during some healings that were just them uh, and the individual or the family. Uh, this James, and along with John and Peter, were with Jesus at the Transfiguration uh, when Jesus was praying. And so uh, James was very close. He's also called James the Great. So this was not someone... Not to uh, say that anyone was uh, insignificant, but this wasn't someone who was more on the outer uh, uh, circle, if you will, outer crowd of the church, uh, if you understand what I'm trying to say. This was someone who was at the heart of this whole thing, the, who was with Jesus from the beginning. Jesus called him to follow him, and, and, and James was there from the beginning. James was a central part, a core part of Jesus' uh, ministry and the church. And uh, we see that Satan, through Herod, attacks at the heart of the Lord's church. This was a big blow. And we might can assume, I think, safely assume that Herod knew this. And he took that opportunity to try to take a uh, major blow to the church. Imprisoned Peter. He certainly would have known who Peter was. And uh, uh, that what he was intending to do with Peter, we don't know. Uh, we're just told that he was going to bring him out to the people. Was he going to parade him around? Was he going to make a spectacle of him? It seems as, as, as that was the case, but... I guess we don't know. Uh, James was the first to die for Jesus. Do you remember in Mark chapter 10, verse 39, uh, James and his brother John 
asked uh, to sit at Jesus' right and left in his new kingdom. And Jesus told James and John, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. Uh, and that was meaning the baptism of suffering. So way back then, they wanted a prominent seat uh, in his kingdom. And Jesus said, that's not for me to decide, but you will be baptized with the same baptism of suffering that I'm going to be baptized with. They didn't understand that at the time, did they? But James, we learn now, was taken and killed by the sword. He suffered for the cause of Christ, for the church. Now, why did this please the Jews? Luke tells us this pleased the Jews, and when, Peter, when, when, when King Herod saw this please the Jews, he arrested Peter. Peter, uh, Herod, King Herod wanted to please the Jews. <coughs> uh, politically, he wanted them, <coughs> excuse me, in his favor. And obviously he's referring to those Jews who did not believe in Jesus, uh, who would have been among the group that Saul was, was, uh, was certainly a part of and perhaps even helped lead and instigate the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, Pharisees, who were still against Jesus and the church. So that lets us know that not only is that group still there, still very much against the church and wanting to stop it as Saul had been wanting to do and as Saul apparently was leading the charge in uh, this uh, that we also have the government now against the church as well in King Herod so persecution against the church is escalating but the church is praying for uh, Peter earnestly now move to verses 6 through 19. We'll do a quick summary here of chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 verses 6 through 19. We see that God rescues Peter by an angel and uh, then we find that Peter meets up at the house where the many of the disciples are gathered and praying. They don't believe that it's him at first but when they realize it's him Peter says to them in verse 17, he tells them he's free. They see he's free. They thought it was his angel at first. Uh, but he says, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Peter wanted James. Now, this is obviously James, Jesus' brother, the author of the book of James. Uh, but Peter wanted James and the brothers to know that he was out, that he was alive, that he was okay. But then we're told by Luke that Peter departed and went to another place. Now, Luke is signaling to us that James was obviously a prominent leader in the church there in Jerusalem. Uh, and we're going to see that in chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council where they, they listen to James's counsel, uh, his guidance on how they should handle the matter that they're, they're addressing. So James is a significant leader in the church in Jerusalem. He's respected. Peter wants James and the brothers to know they're in Jerusalem. He's okay, and then he departs to another place. Why do you think Peter departs to another place? And why does Luke not tell us where he went? Well, probably because he was in hiding because he had just escaped King Herod. In fact, Luke tells us that Herod went looking for him and couldn't find him. He couldn't stay there at Mary's house because uh, Herod probably knew or would have easily found out that the disciples met there regularly. That was one of their meeting places. So he couldn't be there. He had to take off. He couldn't let anybody know where he was. So he's somewhere. We don't see him again until chapter 15 uh, at the Jerusalem Council when he does go back to Jerusalem. So likely he doesn't go far, but he is obviously in hiding somewhere. Uh, Herod ends up killing the guards who were there to watch over Peter. Uh, he can't find them. But in chapter 12, verses 20 through 24, this is a different story. Now we turn to Herod, and there's a story about Herod. You know, the attention has been on Peter and Saul and James and the church, and now we're, the camera moves and it looks at 
King Herod. We get a little bit more about him. For whatever reason, in verses 20 through 24, uh, Herod is angry with the people of the cities of Tyre and Sidon. We don't know why. It's possible that it was business related to trade routes. But for whatever reason, they were able to get a meeting with King Herod by probably bribing his uh, personal attendant. They get a meeting with him to try to make peace with him because they needed uh, to continue to be able to buy food from King Herod instead of importing it from further, which would have been more expensive. And so they praise him when he spoke. Uh, Josephus, a first century uh, Jewish historian, he recorded that uh, uh, Herod's clothing, his garment, whatever it was, was, was shiny silver. I don't know exactly what that would have been, it would have looked like, but that he was, you know, completely covered in, in some kind of silver uh, uh, royal uh, type of clothing. And so as the sun would have shined on him, it would have reflected and shined on, on, in the people's eyes, if you can imagine that. And then as he spoke, and of course they want to flatter him, they want to win him over, they want to please him. What do they say in verses, verse 22 of Acts 12? The, when he spoke, they said, the voice of a God and not of a man. And God struck Herod down. Now, that sounds like he struck him dead. Let's see what verse 22 says exactly. And the people were shouting the voice of a God and not of a man. Verse 23, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down. Now, we tend to think that means dead because then Luke says, because he did not give glory to God, he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last, that does sound like it happened right there in the moment. And perhaps it did. Uh, but the reason God did this was because Herod wanted the glory. Herod wanted the praise. And God said, not so fast. Because you did not give God the glory. Of course, Herod wasn't going to do that. God struck him down. The prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 42, 8 of Isaiah, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another. God doesn't share his glory like that with someone else who wants to take glory as if they are God. Now, Josephus, again, a first century Jewish historian, uh, here's what he wrote about Herod's, uh, what happened to Herod. A severe pain also arose in his belly and began in a most violent manner. And when he had been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days, he departed this life. So according to Josephus, uh, Herod lived five days with intense intestinal abdominal pain and he died and worms ate him. Now, intestinal worms were common in those days. It is possible that his appendix burst and, or he had some intestinal obstruction and he also had intestinal worms, which made things worse. And when the uh, appendix bursting or the intest uh, um, uh, intestinal obstruction burst, the worms, uh, you know, burst out. It's a gross thing to think about. Uh, and, and they were all over. Is that a possibility? That's what an extra biblical historian recorded. Uh, Another ancient source says that it was a pain of the bowels that was remediless, came upon him, 
and sore torments of the inner parts. The worms rose up out of the body of this wicked man, and whilst he lived in sorrow and pain, his flesh fell away, and the filthiness of his smell was noisome to all his army. So it certainly could have been something like that, an illness and infestation with intestinal worms. Um, Luke says the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. That does not mean it could not have lasted five days. Uh, it does not mean that he dropped dead on the spot and worms appeared and ate him. However, God could have done it that way and we don't know for certain. It is just interesting to think about but the main point is uh, not exactly what happened and how. The most important point is that Herod thought he could destroy the church, but he was destroyed instead. Verse 24 tells us this of Acts chapter 12. But the word of God increased and multiplied. You see the word but there that Luke puts there at the beginning, but the word of God increased and multiplied. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last, but the word of God increased and multiplied. It draws a contrast between King Herod, who fell, but the word of the Lord flourished, and the church flourished. That's the point to take away from that. God will get the glory and his kingdom will not be stopped as Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16. And the word of the Lord flourished. The church continues, the gospel continues, and more people continue to come to Christ. Thank you for joining us and studying with us. Next week we will study the rest of chapter 12. Uh, there's one verse left and we'll go through chapter 14. God bless.